morning. It's good to see all of you here today. This beautiful Sunday morning, the sun's supposed to peek out from behind the clouds for our baptismal service. It'll be a grand evening, and I hope you all can make that today, uh, 6 o'clock at Tapman Run. I want you to do something for me this morning. How many of you have a husband or a wife with you, a loved one sitting next to you this morning? If you don't, I want you to pretend. But I want, I want you to turn to that person right now and look at that person. Now I want you to look back up here. Now I want you to imagine the next time you turn to look at that person, they weren't there. They're gone in this life. How would that make you feel? The thought of that is probably heartbreaking to most of us. And yet, yesterday afternoon at 10 to 1, uh, you all heard that Pastor Blair was um, out on the new church property, and he was working, doing some work on the church property, burning some brush with his grandson and some other guys from the church, and, and he fell flat on his face, dead. He was probably dead before he hit the ground. And uh, why do you think it's so important that the scriptures teach us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, that now is the accepted time, and today is the day of salvation. Why do you think that's important? I asked Denny that this morning. Denny said, because we don't know when we're leaving this life. There isn't any one of us know when we're leaving this life. But we know we are going to leave this life. You are going to leave this life. We had a funeral on Friday. Andy Kyler. His spirit soul left this life. Yesterday afternoon, Pastor Blair, good health, 65 years old, left this life. Suddenly, it's going to happen to every one of us. It's going to happen. And you know, it's important for you and I to have our house ready, to have our house in order, because we don't know when. None of us know the day, none of us know the hour. But we do know that it's going to happen to all of us. This week, I received an email on Monday from a young lady that comes to church here. And she said to me in the email, she said, Pastor, do, do we have any groups here in the church that, go, that goes out and knocks on the doors and hands out tracts and hands out cards to the people in the community, to the unchurched people? You know, I was embarrassed to respond to her. Because the answer to that is no, we don't. And why don't we? Why don't we? Our purpose is here at Beavertown Bible Church, and you guys can say them with me. What are our purposes here? Winning the lost to Jesus Christ. Getting unchurched folks into the, into the church so they can hear the gospel of Christ, so that they can be born again into God's family. And why don't we have people going out into our communities, knocking on doors and, and letting them, inviting them to the church and inviting them in? If, we would, if every one of us would invite somebody to church, we'd have to set up chairs in here. Wouldn't that be a good problem to have? And she says, well, pastor, in my old church, we used to do that. And we started with one bus. And it's one of the biggest Baptist churches in eastern Pennsylvania. And there are over 30 buses now. What an incredible ministry. And she says, I have a heart for people like that. I'm shy, but when it comes to knocking on doors and handing out tracts and handing out cards, I can do that. God just uses me, even though I don't know what to say. She's a willing vessel. And praise God for her desire to do that. Because this has spurred on some, some uh, thinking and, and, and her and some other ladies and, and hopefully men are going to get involved and do this. Not just in our community in Trough Creek Valley, but in surrounding communities. And then for Tuesday, I was on my way home. I had picked up a piece of furniture for uh, uh, Aaron and Tara in Altoona. Tara and I had gone to Altoona Tuesday afternoon and to pick up a piece of furniture and I dropped it off at their apartment, and I was coming back through Big Valley, and I saw this sign. If any of you traveled down Big Valley, you read all those wonderful signs. 
Coming home, I saw this sign on the right-hand side. It says, when you die, notice it said when, not if. It said, when you die, where will you spend eternity? In heaven or in hell? And that prompted this message today. It really did. Uh, her email, this person's email, and that sign really spurred on this message. The verses that you and I are going to read today is really the final event in all of history. The final event in all of history. And God is putting the last period on the last sentence of the last paragraph on the last page in human history. This is the final judgment for all those who die lost or apart from God. All those who die apart from Him all those who die apart from him who have never repented of their sins, all of those who die who have never received the free gift of God's grace. And if we're an evangelistic church, we should care about those people. We should care right now that there's people. As I stand here in the last seven minutes and share with you, there are people that have gone off into eternity. I can assure you this, Pastor Blair yesterday afternoon didn't expect that he was going to be with the Lord this morning. He knew his day was coming, but he didn't know when. You know, it's not easy to preach about this awesome final judgment. It's not. It's not easy to preach about. And I want you to know that I take absolutely no pleasure whatsoever in even thinking about anyone being thrown into the lake of fire for all of eternity. And neither does God. God doesn't take pleasure in that. In fact, you know that hell was not made for people. It was created for the devil and his angels. God doesn't send people to hell. Sin sends people to hell. And we must accept his salvation from sin. And if we say no to God's provisions in this life, then the only alternative is hell. And I love this because we can't remain neutral on this. There's no fence with God. There's no fence. We're either for Him or against Him. You can't sit on the fence. God is love, yes. And He loves us so much that He took our hell for us on Calvary's cross. If we'll repent of those sins for which He died and received His payment. But He's a holy and He's a perfect God. And if you and I don't accept his payment for our sins, then we have to pay for them ourselves. What we are going to look at this morning in Revelation chapter 20, from verse 11 to verse 15, I believe is probably the darkest hour in human history. This is the supreme court of the universe. All the lost are going to be judged. And after the verdict is read, it's final. There's no appeals. The sentence is a death sentence. It's kind of like uh, for us people who worked inside the correctional facilities for a number of years, it's kind of like a, a death row and a torture chamber all wrapped up into one with no end for all eternity. And I want you to know this this morning, too. It's not politically correct, what I'm going to share with you. And there may be some in here who won't accept it. There may be some in here that won't receive it. But their argument will be with God, not me. Folks, if I've ever preached a sermon direct from God's Word, then this is it. I want you to turn, if you're not already there, to Revelation chapter 20. I'd like you to look at verse 11 through verse 15. The title of the message this morning is The Seven Aspects of the Great White Throne Judgment. Today, uh, my prayer is that we'll get through three of them, the first three. And in your outline there, you can follow along too. But we're going to read these a few verses here in Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> and listen to what John writes as I read. And he says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, 
small and great. Stand before God. That word before means literally in the face of God. Stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. You know, we have people's names written on membership rolls in churches whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. How many of you have ever been inside of a courtroom? You think that's a set-up question, don't you? (laughs) I've been in lots of courtrooms, and they all have the same thing. They all have the witnesses' chairs, the jury loft, the bench where the judge sits, the witness stand, and where the pews or seats where the families sit, and then they have the defense table and the prosecution's table. But I want you to know that this courtroom that the scriptures are talking about, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to break it down into terms that we can understand. The seven aspects of the great white throne judgment. This morning we're going to look at the courtroom. We're going to look at the judge. We're going to look at the accused. Next week when we come together, we're going to look at the evidence, the defense, the verdict, and the sentence. But today we're going to look at the courtroom, the judge, and the accused. And the first thing there in your outline is that Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, the courtroom is the great white throne. There's never been a courtroom like this courtroom. The courtrooms on earth are quite overshadowed by this courtroom. Verse 11 says, And I saw a great white throne. And we can stop right there because those three words represent three things. Great. Great, John writes. I saw a great. It speaks of Uh, of uh, magnitude. The Greek is uh, uh, megathos or megas. It speaks of magnitude, uh, exceedingly great, large, but it also speaks of might. It speaks of power and it speaks of fear. The lost. He's talking about those who have never received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. The lost. This is the judgment where all those who have rejected Jesus Christ will stand. And they will stand in this courtroom. They will stand there. The lost standing before this throne, they will be overcome with an incredible sense of power and might and awe and fear. I've stood in many courtrooms and I've stood in fear and I've stood in awe. But none like this. The lost will stand at this one. And you know, and there are many people today, I've talked to them, that talk flippantly about, hey, what they're going to tell God when they stand before the great white throne judgment. I want you to know something. They won't say a word. They won't say a word. The person who never got saved will not be able to do anything but weep and tremble at this judgment. Their mind may go back to each time that they took God's name in vain. They won't be using it in vain here. They may go back to think about the jokes that they told about hell. But there will be no joking on this day. They may remember the way that they used to think about hell. You know, um, uh, hell for company and heaven for climate. You know, I've always preferred company to climate. I hate that saying. I've heard it. People say, oh, go to hell. If they only knew what they were saying. I'll be down there shoveling coal with, with, the next, with my buddy right next to me. No, you won't. No, you won't. The way they used to think about hell, the way they used to make jokes about hell, the reality of what hell will be like is now going to sink in. The great white 
throne, the courtroom, magnitude, power, might, and fear. The Bible tells us over in Hebrews, I want you to look back in your outline, or you have, look at Hebrews 10.31. This courtroom is unlike any other. Hebrews 10, 31. You know, and we have people in this world, and, and I know people are not the enemies, but they're deceived, they're lost, and they need to hear the truth. And these people uh, that are lost apart from Christ, you know, how dare anyone to think that we could ever stand before God and be anything but speechless. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 31, it says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, you've got to understand this scripture when you go back into Deuteronomy and you read this, because this is a quote from the Old Testament. The idea here is, is, is to fall into the hands of the living God after despising his mercy and salvation is going to be horrific. It's horrific. Look over a couple chapters in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. And the Bible says, for our God is a consuming fire. And the image here is given, if the image here is a fearful one, it's a fearful one, that punishment as inflicted by God is awful and overwhelming. But it's not his desire to do that. God's desire that all come to repentance. God doesn't take pleasure in this. Our loving God has given man a free will to choose. And look in our scripture in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. I want you to notice how this judgment begins. He says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face, look here, the earth and the heaven fled away. This judgment begins with the disposing of the earth. The disposing of the earth. Everyone's going to realize when they stand here that everything that they ever lived for in this life is gone forever. Everything that they put before God is gone forever. All their possessions, gone. All their pleasures, gone. All their popularity, it's gone. All their prestige is gone. Their family, gone. Their children, gone. Disposed of. And now they're left with God one-on-one. One-on-one. On one in the face of God. Who's now going to dispose of them. That's tough to say. And that's not politically correct. But that's what the Bible says. Was cast into the lake of fire. Hear this, folks, that in the very end of our life, all that you and I have left is our soul. That's it. Do you understand that? All that we have left when we come to the end of our life is this soul. That's it. And it's no wonder that Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, he says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will he exchange for his soul? And so when we read the first word of the courtroom, great. The word great stands for power. It stands for might. It stands for magnitude. It stands for fear. It has all those definitions. It's unlike any other courtroom you've ever been in. The second word of this courtroom is white white and that speaks of light and purity light and purity light will expose all of their works light's going to expose all the things that they've done in their life that were meaningless they counted for nothing and purity speaks of the unapproachable purity of Jesus Christ the fact that they cannot approach him because at that great right throne judgment, they can't come to Christ. They can't approach him. 
People who are lost in this life, when they get to this point, and this is going to come, this is an absolute truth, they cannot approach Jesus Christ and say, Lord, but I was a good person. And say, Lord, I want to receive you now. They can't do it. And this is important because many on that day will stand before God and say, I am a good person. Didn't I do good things? But that will mean nothing compared to his unapproachable purity. The only way that you and I can ever be pure enough in this life to stand before God is to be washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only way. That's the only way. Look at Isaiah chapter 1 and look at verse 18. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Look what God says. And, and look, look at how his heart is bent here. He says, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Come, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. This is a solemn act on the part of God telling sinners that I'll justify my ways to you. I'll show you my ways. I'll prove to you. Because he wants none to ever face this judgment. Look at Psalm 51. And look at verse 7. And David writes, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. The whole structure of Psalm 51, the whole entire psalm, the whole structure of that psalm implies that he desires, that David desires an internal change. If you're not a Christian in here today, I pray and hope that you desire an internal change. That you desire God to do a work that only God can do in your hearts. And not only for you personally in here, maybe you are a Christian in here, but that God would give you the desire to, to carry that passion and that same desire out into the communities of our lost world right here in Trough Creek Valley. We see the power, and it's great, the great white throne. <clears throat> and we see the purity, it's white. And look at the third word of that. He says throne. Folks, that speaks of potentate. Our pastor's group, we always throw that word around jokingly. Chief potentate, the great potentate. God is the supreme potentate. It means supreme authority. It means mighty. The great white throne. This is the courtroom. The throne speaks of potentate and God himself will be in charge on that day. He's going to call the shots. And I know today people, so many people, drag his name through the mud. And they make fun of his followers. They make fun of Christians who desire to live their life for him. But on that day, it's God who sits on his throne. The powerful, pure potentate. The creator who allowed them every breath they ever took. The Creator, the Savior, who died in their place. The Spirit that convicted their hearts time and time again. Urging them to repent and be saved. He's allowed them a free will to choose for years and years. But on that day, God sits on the throne as the mighty potentate. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 15. 
He says, which in his times, his times, God's times, he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And folks, you'll either put him on the throne of your heart today, or you'll stand before his great white throne on that day. You know, in the Garden of Eden, well, look back here before we get to the Garden. Look in verse 11 again. Look what it says. It says, there was found no place for them. The end of that verse. It says, heaven, earth, and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And that literally means that there was no place to run, there's no place to hide. Can't escape. Can't get away from it. And in the, in the Garden of Eden, <clears throat> when Adam sinned, he tried to hide himself behind a tree. No trees on this day. When Jonah sinned, he tried to take the boat and get away from it all. There's no transportation away on that day. No fig leaves, just the ugly nakedness of our sin exposed. Nowhere to run. Every excuse that we ever had, those that have ever had that are lost, is stripped away. It's one-on-one, -on -one, the sinner and the Savior at the great white throne. Folks, that's the courtroom. That's the courtroom. And look at verse 11. I want to show you the judge. Verse 11 reveals to us the judge. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it. Him that sat on it. Who's the judge of the universe? Who's the judge of the universe? It's not the Father. It's not God the Father. It's not. Look back in John chapter 5. And look at verse 22. John chapter 5 and verse 22. It's not God the Father. John 5 verse 22 says, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. It's Jesus Christ. He's the judge of the universe. It's the sweet Savior that we read about in the Gospels. It's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But on this day, He's no longer the Lamb. He's the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The Redeemer is the Ruler. The Savior is the Sovereign. Look at Acts chapter 10. Just a couple more passages of Scripture to reveal to you who is the judge of the universe. Acts chapter 10 and verse 42. And as Peter was speaking in Cornelius' house, it's interesting because here he's preaching to the Gentiles that they would be saved, but he says this is part of what God has commanded them to preach. He says in verse 42, And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Jesus Christ is going to judge the living. Jesus Christ is going to judge the dead. Look at uh, Acts chapter 17 and look at verse 31. Acts 17, verse 31. It says, Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. The judge of the universe is not God the Father, it's God the Son, Jesus Christ. You know, and I don't want to sound judgmental when I say this, and, and, and I, I don't, I really don't. But those folks, uh, we had a group here on uh, Friday night singing, and they sang a song about excuses. And I got to tell you, it was quite comical when you heard it. But yet, there's humor in, in truth. And they sang about excuses. And uh, I do believe that there are those that come on Easter and come on Christmas that have genuinely been born into God's family. 
But I believe that there are those that come on Easter and come on Christmas, they think that's going to save them and get them into heaven. And that's not the fact. And some will come on Easter, and some will come on Christmas, and they'll have never received Jesus Christ, and they'll think they're going to heaven. But it'll be the resurrected Jesus Christ who's going to damn their soul to hell because they rejected his salvation. See, I told you this is not politically correct. You will not hear this in most churches today. There was a man, two men out on a, on a lake, and they were fishing. The one man was in his own boat, and the other fisherman was, well, the other man was in his, other, in his own boat. Two men on the lake, two different boats. The one fisherman fell overboard in his boat. He started to drown. The other fisherman that was in his boat, he saw what was taking place, threw his rod down, and he jumped into the lake, and he swam over to the drowning man, and he, and he put his arm around him, and he drug him and swam, got him to safety, and he saved him. Well, the man that was drowning, drowning, found himself in some legal issues years later. He was sitting in the middle of a courtroom, waiting for the judge to come out of his chamber. Lo and behold, the judge came out of his chamber, and here it was the fisherman in the other boat that saved him a year earlier. And the man that was drowning said, boy, I sure am glad to see you. He said, I may have pulled you to safety on that day, but today I'm your judge. Today I'm your judge. The same Jesus who begs for... The same Jesus who begs to be your Savior today will one day be your judge if you reject Him as your Savior. Folks, that's the courtroom. And that's the judge, Him that sat on it. Jesus Christ, our Savior. The Lion of the tribe of Judah. I want to show you in verse 12, the accused, because this is where I hope to finish up today. He says, and I saw the dead, small and great. I saw the dead, small and great. The big shots, the nobodies, the up-and-comers, the down-and-outers, the CEO and the lowest employee, the professors, the uneducated, kings and homeless people. They all are the accused on that day if they die lost. He says the great, the small and great. It doesn't matter what your socioeconomic status is in this life. It makes no difference. Verse 13. Let's read verse, finish reading verse 12 and then into verse 13. It says, And I saw the dead, small and great. That's the accused. We're going to come back to them. Stand before God. They stand literally in the face of God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea, that's interesting, the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell were delivered up, the de or delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. Folks, that's the second resurrection. That's the resurrection of the lost. The first resurrection was of the saints. That's going to be when Christ returns at the sound of the trump. This resurrection takes place 1,007 years later at the great white throne. And so, obviously, those that have died all throughout history, those who have died are going to get some sort of resurrected body. The Bible says the sea gave up the dead. You know, I thought about that passage. The oceans, the seas gave up the dead. I thought, why would it specifically mention that? Do you remember how many people were lost during the flood? You know, and I think the illustration here is for you and I that it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how disintegrated 
or, or how disintegrated a body can become or deteriorated a body can become, God can regenerate it and bring it back. And it's going to happen. The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. The first resurrection was of the saints more than a thousand years before this. This is the second resurrection. In other words, this isn't about <clears throat> whether they are guilty or innocent. That's not what this is about. Because it's clear they're guilty. They've already rejected. This is not a trial to see whether they go free or not. It's not one of those trials. This is not about allegations. This is making it clear why they are going to hell forever. For all eternity. And they've already been in hell awaiting this judgment. There's two words in the scriptures in the New Testament and the Old Testament that talk about, actually there's three, but there's two words for hell in the scriptures that I want to share with you this morning. One of them is Hades, and the other one is Gehenna. Hades in the New Testament is Sheol in the Old Testament. But they can be likened unto a local jail and a prison. The one is temporary, but no less vile, just less permanent. Notice the words in verse 13 and 14, death and hell. Verse 13, it says, death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And down in verse 14 it says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Death gives up the body. And hell gives up the soul. Then both body and soul are cast into Gehenna, the eternal lake of fire. There is no appeal, and there's no parole. In our pastor's meeting on Wednesday, we talked about this a little bit. You and I can't wrap our earthly minds around hell. And, and, and you know, and, and as I think about hell, and I think about the thing, because there's going to be memory there. There's going to be, there's, you're going to be able to think. You're going to be able to see. Remember the rich man in Luke chapter 16? when he lifted up his eyes from hell, and, 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 and he asked, he said, Father Abraham, he said, send Lazarus to dip his finger in some water and cool my tongue. So there's feeling there. There's feeling. They can feel there. There's sight there. There's pain there. There's remorse there. So one pastor, I heard him preach on this. He said, it's like going to hell. He envisioned going to hell in an ironclad suit. Boom. Could you imagine that? Burning and burning and burning and burning and burning and burning, feeling the pain, knowing you're in torment, and not being able to do a thing about it. You know, the greatest thing for me, probably, it just in my little simple comprehension of the scriptures in regards to hell, the greatest thing is, just like, just like the rich man could look and see, and I shared this Wednesday, probably the most disturbing thing to me is, is knowing that there's a separation. Because Abraham said, said, there's a great gulf fix between you and where we are. So that we can't go to where you are and you can't come to where we are. It's fixed. It's a great gulf fixed. And so that means that in hell, to me when I read that scripture, it means that people in hell can see the other side. And they can't get there. They can't do a thing about it. Can you imagine standing in eternal torment? Eternal torment. Seeing the other side. And knowing you can't get there. It's not for a week. It's not for ten minutes. Whew, thank you, Lord, for getting me out of there. It's forever. We're an evangelistic church. Evangelism and discipleship. Every ministry we have here is formed out of those two purposes. If they do not meet those two purposes, we don't do it. 
We are called to be his hands and feet. Well, folks, in your outline, I broke up four groups at the great white throne, or four mindsets. I want you to know that they're all sinners. They've all rejected Christ, every one of them. But I broke them up into four mindsets because as I thought about the sinners, I thought about the excuses, and I thought about the mindsets, here's what I come up with. The first group of people that are going to be at the great white throne that will have this mindset are the sinners. You say, they're all sinners. Yes, they're all sinners. And so are we, but we're saved sinners. These are lost sinners. I want you to look in John chapter 3, verse 18. John chapter 3 and verse 18. It says, He that believeth on him, on Jesus Christ, is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. These are the sinners. These are the ones who hate God. These are the ones who don't mind speaking out against God. They hate the church. They don't believe the Bible's true. And they're in your face about it. We know people like that. There are the self-righteous, the self-righteous. Look at Isaiah 64 and verse 6. Isaiah 64 and verse 6 says this, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all of our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. The self-righteous, those are those people who think that they'll go to heaven because they lived a good life. They think that the gospel is for perverts. They think that the gospel is for thieves and for murderers. Well, it is. But they don't see themselves as sinners. The next group of people are the slow deciders. The slow deciders. They know that they need to get saved. And they want to get saved. And they're going to get saved someday. Someday. I got time. I got plenty of time. But they keep putting it off. And I want you to know that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. But the Bible makes it plain how important it is to deal with this immediately. I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 3, and I want you to look at verse 15. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Today, if you are hearing God's voice, this morning, and he's drawing you to himself, harden not your hearts. Harden not your hearts. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Slow deciders need to understand something. There's no second chance at the great white throne. Just as in Noah's day, there was years, there was 120 years of warning and preaching. And suddenly, the ark door slammed shut and was sealed. And the sky began to rain. And then it was too late. This very well could be the last sermon you ever hear. Some of you may say, praise the Lord. Some of you may say, well, you're just trying to scare me. You know what? I would rather rather scare you to heaven than lull you to hell. The fourth group in our crowd that I listed as the four groups at the great white throne are the Sunday churchgoers. The ones who have their names on the church membership rolls but not in the Lamb's book of life. They'll go to hell with a Bible in their hand, so to speak. 
And you know what? And the devil doesn't mind that at all. He'd just soon send you to hell from the church house than he would the bar house or the whore house or any other house. They may have a fancy suit on. They have, may have nice dresses on. They may even wear a Sunday school pin. They may even have an offering statement at the end of each year. But they've never truly accepted Christ for themselves. The Bible says ye must be born again into God's family. How about you this morning, Beavertown Bible Church? Do you fit into one of these groups? You can be saved today, and you can avoid the scene at the great white throne and all that follows it. Folks, today we looked at the courtroom. We looked at the judge, and we looked at the accused. Next week, if you think this week's graphic, next week we're going to look at the evidence against them. We're going to look at the defense. There is none. We're going to look at the verdict. And then we're going to look at the sentence. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're in here this morning and you, you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's very important that you do. My dear brother and friend, and many of us have heavy hearts in here this morning because we lost a, a dear friend yesterday. We lost him this side of eternity. But he was born again into God's family. He's home with the king. Guess what? He doesn't want to come back here. And guess what? He wants the ministry to continue. He poured 39 years of his life into preaching messages like this so people would be one into God's kingdom. And he'd want it to go forward. I don't know your hearts today, and you all look so good to me. I don't know your hearts. And I'm just going to ask you this simply. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, why are you holding back? now the Bible says today is a day of salvation now is the acceptable time if you need to do business with the Lord this morning I invite you to come to this altar of prayer if you need to give your heart to Jesus Christ for the very first time I invite you to come to this altar of prayer if you're a Christian and you've backslidden in your walk with Christ I encourage you to come and make it right with Christ this morning at this altar of prayer if you're a Christian and you've never been baptized I encourage you tonight at 6 p.m. to get baptized. What's holding you back? Is it pride? What's holding you back? If you have a need this morning, any one of those needs, I encourage you to come. Would you stand with me as we close?